Hi, my name is Graham Smith, and I'm one of the authors that helped develop the learning approach to mathematics that is found in our textbook as well as the video you are about to experience. To learn more about our approach to learning mathematics, visit the web address that accompanies this video. Now, enjoy the video. Square Roots and the Pythagorean Theorem. This video will help you evaluate the square root of a perfect square, approximate the square root of a number, and use the Pythagorean Theorem. Evaluate the square root of a perfect square. Start with a definition. Given a number n, the square root of n is written as the square root of n. This is the notation we use right there. The square root of n is the number that when multiplied by itself gives n. For example, if we take the square root of 4, I would read that, the square root of 4, it's 2. Because if I take this answer of 2 and multiply it by itself, 2 times 2 gives me 4. The square root of 36, we're looking for the number that when we multiply it by itself will give us 36. Well, that number is 6 because 6 times 6 is 36. Now, the square roots that we're going to take a look at in this particular case are all going to be perfect squares, meaning that when we take the square root of a number, it's going to work out to be a nice whole number. Not all square roots work out this way, but just for starting out here, we're only going to start out with perfect squares, meaning all of our answers are going to be nice whole numbers like 2 or 6. Another note here, that square roots are evaluated during the exponent step of the order of operations. Now let's take a look at some examples that will help you understand how to find the square root of a perfect square. Example 1. Find the square root of 25. Well, if we're looking for the square root of 25, we're looking for the number that when we multiply it by itself, it gives us 25. And since I can take 5 times 5 to give me 25, the square root of 25 then is going to have an answer of 5. Example 2. Find the square root of this fraction, 4 49ths. Well, to find the square root of a fraction, what we can actually do is just take the square root of the numerator and then the square root of the denominator. Let's take a look at what we get now. If I take the square root of 4, I'm looking for the number that multiplied by itself will give me 4. Well, that is 2. With 49, I'm looking for a number. This number times itself will give me 49. That's 7, because 7 times 7 is 49. So when I take the square root of this fraction, 4 49ths, I get the fractional answer, 2 sevenths. Example 3. Find, the, find the, the, the result of this square root of 16 times the square root of 81. Well, we said that the square root gets evaluated during the exponent stage, which is certainly done before the multiplication that we have there. So let's see. Let's write this out. So we have the square root of 16 times the square root of 81. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take these square roots. The square root of 16, I'm looking for a number multiplied by itself that gives me 16. That's 4. 81, I'm looking for a number times itself that gives me 81. That's 9. And then the next step is to do the multiplication. 4 times 9 is 36. Now it's time to check your understanding of finding the square root of a perfect square. Pause your video player and answer these guided practice questions. When you're done, hit play to see how you did. Question 1. We're asked to find the square root of 64. Square root of 64, what number times itself would give us 64? It's going to be 8. Question 2. Find the square root of 25 80 firsts. So what we're going to do is we're just going to find the square root of each of these individually. The square root of 25 and then the square root of 81. And that will give us our fractional answer. The square root of 25 is 5. The square root of 81 is 9. So we get an answer of 5 ninths. Question 3. Find the result of this, the square root of 36 minus the square root of 4. So remember, square roots get evaluated during the exponent stage, which means they're going to get done before the subtraction. So first I'm going to take the square root of 36, which is 6. Then I'm going to take the square root of 4, which is 2. Then I'm going to do the subtraction, so I get an answer of 4. Approximate the square root of a number. Now the square roots that we took a look at in the last examples and guided practices were perfect squares, meaning that when we take the square root of those numbers, they end up being a nice whole number. But often the square root of a number will not result in an answer that is a whole number. For example, if we take a look here, the square root of 4, 
4 is a perfect square because if we take the square root of 4, we get a nice whole number of 2. Now if we take a look at the square root of 5, that square root of 5 has to be between the square root of 4 and definitely between the square root of 9. The square root of 9 is another perfect square. 9 is another perfect square. When we take the square root of that, we get a nice whole number of 3. Now the square root of 5 has to be between 2 and 3. There aren't any whole numbers between 2 and 3, so the square root of 5 must be a decimal number. To calculate numbers like this, like the square root of 5 that are not a perfect square, we either use a table or a calculator to come up with these numbers. Now, I went ahead and put the square root of 5 into my calculator, and when I punched it out, this is what I got. 2.23606679. Now, this decimal number is going to keep going on, and that's what those little dots mean that this decimal number is going to keep going on. There is no pattern to this decimal number. And so what happens is we can't actually get an exact answer for the square root of 5. So we just get an approximation. So what we would do is we would take this decimal number, 2.23606, and we would round it to some specified value. Most of the time when you round these, you're either going to be rounded to the tenths place, which is right here, or you would be rounding it to the hundredths place, which is right there. So if I was rounding this to the hundredths place, I would say then the square root of 5, my approximation for that, notice I'm using an approximation symbol there, not an equal sign. I would say the approximation for that rounded to the hundredths place is 2.24, because this 6 told me to round that 3 up. Now let's take a look at some examples that will help you understand how to find the, or how to approximate the square root of a number. Example 4. The square root of 20 falls between which two numbers? Well, so we're looking for the square root of 20. We want to know where it falls between. So let's look at the perfect square below the square root of 20. So if we look going down from 20, we take uh, 19. That is not a perfect square. 18, that is not a perfect square. 17, no. 16, yes. 16 is a perfect square. I can take the square root of 16. That would give me 4. Now let's go on the other side. If we're going up from 20, we would look at 21. That is not a perfect square. 22, nope. 23, nope. 24, nope. 25, yes. I can take the square root of 25. That's a perfect square. And it will come up to be a whole number. And that's 5. So it looks like the square root of 20 is going to be, is going to fall between 4 and 5. And so the way we would write that is we would say the square root of 20 it's going to be bigger than 4, but it's going to be less than 5. Example 5. Approximate the square root of 20 to the thousandths place using a table or calculator. All right, well, we know this answer is going to be between 4 and 5. If I punch this into my calculator, the square root of 20 into the calculator, this is what I get. 4.4721. And now I want to round this answer to the thousandths place. So let's say we go tenths, hundredths, thousandths. This one would tell me how to round the two, and it's going to tell me to keep it the same. Now, one thing that I want to do then is when I say the square root of 20, rounded to the thousandths place, we're getting just an approximation here. So I want to use an approximation symbol, and this would be 4.472. Now it's time to check your understanding of finding, approximating the square root of a number. Pause your video player and answer these guided practice questions. When you're done, hit play to see how you did. Question 4. The square, root of 40, the square root of 42 falls between which two numbers? Well, let's take a look. Here's the square root of 42. Let's work our way down until we find a perfect square and up until we find a perfect square. So 41, nope, that is not a perfect square. 40, nope. 39, nope. 38, nope. 37, nope. 36, yep. I can take the square root of 36, that's 6. Let's work on the other side now. Uh, 43, nope. 44, nope. 45, nope. 46, 47, 48, nope. 49, yes. I can take the square root of 49, it gives me 7. So the square root of 42 is going to fall between 6 and 7. It has to be bigger than 6 but it has to be smaller than 7. Question 5. Approximate the square root of 42 to the thousandths place using a table or calculator. So 
using a table or a calculator, we punch in the square root of 42, and we should get 6.4807. So tenths, hundredths, thousandths place. The 7 tells us how to round that digit in the thousandths place, so we're going to round that one up. So the square root of 42, the approximation for that, rounded to the thousandths place, is 6.481. Use the Pythagorean Theorem. Let's start with a definition. The Pythagorean Theorem states that for any right triangle, the leg squared plus the leg squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared. And some of these words may seem a little unfamiliar to you. So in a right triangle, notice we have to have a right angle in our right triangle. So there's our right angle in our triangle. Here's one of the legs. Here's the other leg. Notice the legs come together to form that 90 degree angle. Now. The, the side of the triangle that is opposite the 90 degree angle is called the hypotenuse of the triangle. So in our formula we would say leg squared plus leg squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared. Now sometimes it can help us and make it a little bit easier to kind of use this this Pythagorean theorem but break it into a formula or make it into a formula to find a missing length of a side in a triangle. And here's what we would do. If we're looking for one of the legs in the triangle because we don't know it, we would take the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus the leg that we know squared and then take the square root of that and that would tell us the missing leg in the triangle. In the other case if we're missing the hypotenuse we don't know what the hypotenuse is then we would take the square root of the leg squared plus the other leg squared. Now let's take a look at some examples that will help you understand how to solve for an unknown side in a right triangle by using the Pythagorean theorem. Example 6. Find the length of the missing side in the right triangle. And here's the formula that we're going to use. The leg equals the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus the known leg. I know to use this formula because you can see down here in my triangle I'm missing a leg. That's the, that's the missing side in this triangle so I want to use this particular formula. So let's take a look. Our missing leg x is going to equal the square root of the hypotenuse squared. Well, the hypotenuse is the one that's directly across from the 90 degree angle. So that's going to be 6 squared minus the other leg squared. Well, the other leg is 3. Minus 3 squared. So taking a look, we're going to get x equals the square root. Now we're going to simplify what's inside the square root first. So we're doing the work in here, and we would start with those exponents. We would take 6 to the second power, which is 36, and then we would take 3 to the second power, which is 9. And now we're going to subtract 9 from 36, which is going to give us 27. And so now I need to take the square root of 27. So I would punch that into my calculator. And the square root of 27 ends up being 5.196. Now, they didn't specify in this question where we need to round. So we will round this answer, and I'm probably going to round it to the hundredths place. Usually if it's not specified what you need to round to, typically we would round to the tenths or the hundredths place. I'll round this one to the hundredths place. So the length of my missing leg here is going to be 5.19. That 9 is going to round up to 10, so it's actually going to be 5.2. And we were measuring with feet here, so it's 5.2 feet. Example 7. Find the length of the missing side in the right triangle. Well, let's take a look. Here, the missing side is a hypotenuse. So we want to use this formula that's, that solves for the hypotenuse. So we would say x, which is our hypotenuse, is going to equal the leg squared. Well, the first leg that I have here is 4. So I'll say 4 squared. The next leg that I have is 1. So I'd say 1 squared. And again, we're going to simplify what's inside that square root. So 4 squared is 16. 1 squared, 1 times 1 is just 1. And so what I'm actually going to evaluate here is the square root of 17. And when I look up, let's come over here, when I look up the square root of 17, I get 4.123. And again, I'm going to round to the hundredths place. It didn't specify which one to round to. So the 2 is in the hundredths place. The 3 tells me to keep that 2 the same. So the length of my missing side is 4.12 and we're talking about meters here so 4.12 meters. Now it's time to check your understanding of solving for an unknown side in a right triangle using the Pythagorean theorem. Pause your video player and answer these guided practice questions. When you're done hit play to see how you did.
Question 6. Find the length of the missing side in the right triangle. Well, you can see the side that we're missing here is the leg. And so this is the formula we want to use that solves for the leg. So we would say, in this case, I don't have a variable there, so we can say this is just still the leg, is going to equal the square root of the hypotenuse squared. Well, here is our 90 degree angle right here. So the hypotenuse needs to be 15 opposite that, so 15 squared, and then minus our other leg squared, which is 5 squared. And so the leg is going to equal, again, we're going to simplify in the square roots, first start with the exponents, and we're going to take 15 squared, which means we need to take 15 times 15. When we do that multiplication, we get 225. So 225, 5 squared, 5 times 5 is just 25. So we get this leg is equal to the square root. 225 minus 25 is 200. So we need to get the square root of 200. When we punch that into the calculator, the square root of 200 is 14.142. Now, it didn't specify what to round this to, so we could round it to the hundredths place or the tenths place. It won't make a difference. So let's say we get our answer here. We're going to get 14. Uh, I'll round to the hundredths place, which is the 4. So the 2 would tell us to keep it the same. So I get 14.14, and we're talking about feet here. Question 7. Find the length of the missing side in the right triangle. Well, you can see here the missing side we're, we're missing is our hypotenuse. Okay, so we're going to use this formula here. And so our shorthand for hypotenuse is just HYP. So I'll say the hypotenuse is going to be the square root of the leg squared. In this case, here's one of my legs is the 3. 3 squared plus the other leg squared, which is 8. So we're going to do 8 squared. And so we're going to start by simplifying what's inside the square roots. 3 squared, that's 3 times 3 is 9. 8 squared, 8 times 8 is 64. So my hypotenuse is going to equal the square root. Well, I'm going to add 9 and 64 together, and that's going to give me 73. And when I take the square root of 73 and punch that into my calculator, I get 8.5. 4, 4. Again, I'll round this to the hundredths place. That's the 4. That 4 tells me to keep that 4 the same. So when I'm finding this missing side, the hypotenuse, it's going to be 8.54. And that was inches. So we're going to include our units of inches on there. If you found this video helpful, I encourage you to check out our other videos that we have on YouTube or visit the web address that accompanies this video to learn more about our approach to learning mathematics.